Hey, hi there, Josh my cool stuff here. We recently just surpassed 10,000 subscribers, so I wanted to do something special to commemorate the event. And as a thanks to all of you. Since I don't do much commentary, I rarely have a chance to convey my appreciation for all of your positivity and support. YouTube comments kind of have a reputation for being a cesspool. When I started producing content, I was fully expecting to have toxicity thrown my way. So it was a huge surprise to find that there's only been maybe one or two toxic comments out of thousands. I don't know what it is, but my channel seems to attract a decent, cool class of people. So yeah, thanks for being cool. Most of you know me for speedruns and challenges, but I used to be really big into building megabases. You might have seen my first megabase album from years ago on Reddit. I'll do a little tour of that later, but first, here is my Don't Starve Together megabase. This is my favorite part of the world, the base hub. These are pig torches, which I am obsessed with. They have a rare chance to spawn in world gen as part of several set pieces. A lot of people world hop until they get the re trap, but nobody appreciates a good pig torch. You can trap them for infinite light, or use the pigs as henchmen for farms. So what you gotta do to get pig torch buddies is first, kill all of the guardian pigs. Don't worry, they spawn back. But while they're gone, place down walls in whatever orientation you fancy, leaving a single spot directly adjacent to the pig torch open and free for the guardian pig to spawn back into. If the guardian pig doesn't spawn in that spot, just kill him and try again. Oh, and be sure to place down some type of food somewhere close by, like a stack of rot, a deer clops eyeball, or a powder cake, so that when they turn into werepigs during full moons, they won't smash the walls down. Because werepigs are kind of dumb in that they just continuously run face first into walls when there's food nearby. The Krampus were pretty easy to trap because they're passive mobs by default, which means they don't attack you unless you attack them. All I did was surround a telelocator focus with grass walls, teleported a Krampus inside, pushed him up to the two moon rock walls, and then sealed him off. The Ice Hounds were much more difficult. Well, maybe difficult isn't the right word, more like tedious. Getting a bunch of skeletons like this is time consuming in itself, but I specifically wanted these head splat dudes for aesthetic reasons, so whenever I got one of the other skeletons I had to hammer it away and try again. So how did I do it? I placed down a telelocator focus, then on each corner and dot of the focus I'd create a skeleton. I'd get down to around 20 health with the help of the guardian pigs, then I'd click a piece of rot onto my desired location to position myself precisely, and finally I'd light the rot on fire. You can actually seal the entire skeleton wall and still hammer away the focus, but it's kind of finicky and tricky to reach it at that point, so I ended up teleporting the hound with one space still open. Five skeletons is enough to keep the hound in place, and the free space gives me some wiggle room to easily reach the focus to hammer it away. But you can also use a deconstruction staff to make things a bit easier. There's actually a funny story behind these guys. Originally, I had two of those ice hound set pieces. The one where sleeping hounds surround an ice staff. The hounds remain asleep until the ice staff is picked up, so I had the idea of leaving the ice staff there and pushing the hounds all the way to the base to be used as decoration. But sadly, it ended up being a bit glitchy. When I'd log in, the hounds would randomly wake from their sleep right smack dab in the middle of the base. I'm sure you can imagine the chaos that caused. So yeah, that idea was kaput. I really wanted some hound statues though, so I brainstormed for a bit and I came up with the idea of skeleton walls. This is the storage area. I used the same method of placing items in front of the chest that I did with my old school mega base. For example, if a chest contains rocks, then I'd place a rock down in front of it to indicate what it contains. I think in DST they added some new chest sign thing, but I still like the old school method. Here is the base hub at night. I love the way everything lights up in the dark. We have some beefalo over here. The beefalo pen is specially designed to prevent the beefalo from smashing the walls during spring. Beefalo only attack walls when they aggro on something like a bird that's landed outside of the walls. So to prevent that, I just placed and smashed a bunch of grass walls. 
The beefalo don't like walking over the smashed walls for whatever reason, so they huddle together in the center, out of range of anything that might be outside. This is the kitchen. You got your crock pots, fridge, bird cages. We have a little moleworm area here. Moleworms are kind of dumb in DST because you can only dig their burrows during dusk or night when they're out and active, or else you permanently destroy the burrow and the moleworm. So yeah, we had a bit of trouble with that. I had to repopulate the moleworms a few times with the help of catcoons and tumbleweeds. Over here we have the koalifant and vulcoat pens. Vulcoats are really nice to have close by the base because you get horns and milk on demand. Since they're walled in, it's easy to get them aggroed and you just need to smack them with the morning star to charge them for milk. Vulcoats are actually really underrated in my opinion. Everybody loves beefalo, but do beefalo give you milk, ice cream, morning stars, and weather pains? No. They give you poop. And the koalas? They serve no purpose besides being adorable. This is a turkey farm. This thing produces so much food it's completely ridiculous. What you do is pick one berry, place it inside the walls, and then patch the wall up. Start picking and the turkeys that spawn will mindlessly walk into the walls because they prefer the berry that's on the ground over the fresh ones on the bushes. Just before dusk hits, kill them all and you have meatball ingredients for days. Or you can convert the berries to poop via wear pigs for a quick and easy source of fuel. Here's the pig village. I was gonna put rabbit hutches on the other side, but I lost interest in this world before the caves update came. I don't know if you remember, but that caves update, man, that took forever. Oh, and these farms are purely for decoration. I figured they had a bit of color. I could probably lay them out more nicely and randomly if I planned the base a bit better, but eh, good enough. Here's a photo that my buddy Genie snapped with the group in the early days. We are standing in a developer graveyard, which is a rare set piece that has the name of the developers inscribed on each of the gravestones. When you dig the graves up, a bunch of ghosts pop up. We actually have three of these incredibly rare developer set pieces in this world. I bring this up to point out that I did increase the likelihood for set piece generation. Set pieces are distinct from the skeleton boons that can be modified in the world gen options. For whatever reason, the devs didn't want to give you the ability to modify a set piece generation, but I'll make some mods so that you can do it too. I'll stick the links in the description if you are interested. This right here is a tumbleweed spawner. You used to be able to locate these by running something placeable, like a tooth trap or a campfire, over the ground. And if there was ever a spot where you should be able to place it but you cannot, it meant that there was some sort of invisible spawner in that location. And being in the desert, it was most likely a tumbleweed spawner. Unfortunately, they patched this out of DST. But I think it still does work in single player, because they don't update single player. <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's good. This is a renovated hound fortress. Here's what it looks like in the wild. I use skeleton walls again here to build a little safe area within the hound mounds where I can place lore plants. The eyeballs actually do a pretty decent job of taking care of the hounds. Then I can just kill the lore plants to get the hound loot. Let's head over to the McTusk camp now. Genie made this massive highway connecting the main base to the McTusk camp. Crazy dedication right here. This is the perfect mini base setup in my opinion. For one, the campfires are actually out of range of the flingmatic. I know, innovative idea, right? To everybody who builds their campfires inside of the flingmatic's range, I'm sorry, but you have to admit, that's pretty dumb. But besides that, you have all of your necessities nice and tidy and summerproof. Love it. We have another koala pen over here for some reason. We just really love koalas, I guess. 
On the other side of the wormhole is the swamp. With a reed trap up north, and two fairy rings off to the sides. Both fairy rings are composed of blue mushrooms. I think originally one of them was green shrooms, but we converted them to blue by haunting them. Back then there was a chance that things would catch on fire when you haunt them, so Genie stood by with a luxury fan to extinguish the flames whenever they sprung up. We did lose one mushroom here, unfortunately. Here is our second satellite base. This is nearby the Mosaic. I suppose we built this out here so that it'd be out of range of the meteors, which do a pretty great job of wrecking everything that you build. Up here is the spider farm. We used another pig torch set piece for it. It's a bit tricky to get the loot, but you can put the pigs to sleep and sneak in if you're quick enough. The final thing I want to showcase in this world is the Tallbird Fort Farm. This is what this set piece looks like naturally. The lore plants actually don't do too good of a job at taking care of the tall birds. The tall birds have just a bit too much health for the eyeballs. I think rabbits would be better, or bunny man rather. But we didn't have access to caves at the time, like I said before. And I sort of lost interest in the world before caves came, so... Okay, that's pretty much all I've got for DST. Let's head off into my first megabase in the very old school Rain of Giants world. Welcome to my Rain of Giants world. And oh man, these pig torch balls are so damn ugly. Here is the storage area. I had a system going on like mob drops were over here, tools over here, etc. We have the kitchen with the eyeball trash can. You can feed this little bugger indestructible stuff that you want to get rid of, like bone shards or tools. Here's the bat farm. The bunny men take care of them pretty easily every dusk. Up here we have the crops. I actually placed all of these by hand. No geomash replacement here. The grass looks pretty decent if I say so myself. Butter farm fueled by cat coons. Here is the fully automatic spider farm. The bunny men are just total beasts. When a spider queen spawns, they easily take care of it and a nest is spawned in its place. The bunny men also regenerate health over time, so the only thing I really had to do was come over occasionally and collect the loot. I have no flingomatics of the main base, so I spent my summers in the desert in order to prevent my base from burning down. Wildfires only spawn in a certain radius around the player, so as long as you're far enough away from your base, you don't have to worry about wildfires. You could also summon rain with, say, a telelocator staff to prevent wildfires. The battle arena is here in the middle of the map. It's where I fought giants and hounds. I have the pig and rabbit battalions with a flingomatic in the middle to protect against fire hounds. Where the meat effigy is, I had some backup materials like tallbird eggs, which is food that I'll never spoil, and some recipes for quick sanity. If I ever found myself in a bind, I could also teleport myself here with a telelocator staff. I was still a beginner in this world, so there is a decent chance that I'd die, even in default survival. The Varg farm is way over here next to the McTuss camp. I teleported a Varg behind these tree and stone walls. Hounds are only able to spawn from the land, so they'll always come from this way and be taken out by the Houndius Shudiae. Shudiuses? But this is a really fantastic way to farm up gems. That's all the interesting stuff on the surface, let's check out the cave base now. I love the caves, there's such a great atmosphere down here. Being in a Slurtle biome though can definitely be a hassle if you don't have some safeguards, because the Slurtle army will constantly be on your tail if you have any rocks in your pockets. Earthquakes will destroy ordinary walls, so I had to construct some tree walls. If you don't know how to make tree walls, essentially what you do is place, not plant, place a pinecone on the ground. Set it on fire and then extinguish it with a flingomatic, ice staff, or luxury fan. Relog and the pinecone will not be planted. Because you can turn placed pinecones into planted pinecones like this, you're able to bunch them up much more closely than you otherwise could. It was particularly difficult setting it up like this though, because the light bulbs were close enough to be caught on fire, 
so I had to stand just far enough away from the trees where I could continually extinguish the light bulbs while the trees burned out. And I had to do it in patches because I could only focus on one set of light bulbs at a time. So yeah, it was basically a nightmare to get it like this, but I think it turned out great. Well, that's pretty much all I've got. I hope you all enjoyed, thanks for watching, and until next time.